20 seconds early, 20 seconds early today. There's the uh, stunner, the Grand Seiko Diver, and that's going to be one of the watches that we're going to actually talk about. And I should probably focus on the large hand. I'm focused on the word spring drive there, and the large hand is a little bit out of focus, but can't get everything. So, okay, there There's goes the, the uh, laptop, so now I've got to stop that. So that doesn't play through. And notification on the watch. A lot of stuff going on. So, oh, i got to put on my background lights. So, we're going to have a continuation of our discussion the other day. And we're going to dig a little deeper. Dig a little deeper into that topic. Let me pull up the uh, chat here so that we can uh, be on top of things. Mr. Roberts is in. Actually, I was on time this time. This was scheduled for 5 o'clock. I was 20 seconds early, so there you go. Hi, Craig and all. Hello, guys, from Jack. Logan M's in the house. Wags is in the house. There was some drama in one of the uh, forums. One of the, I think it was the horology talk on, on uh, Facebook, one of the group, Facebook groups. I think Dudley got kicked out. <laughs> he got banned from the group. Oh, well. Stuff happens, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about is there a perfect one watch solution? And I'm a little bit perplexed. I, I don't know that there is. I'm, we're going to look at several options. On the thumbnail, I have, let's see here which ones I have on the thumbnail. <clears throat> I have the Grand Seiko Spring Driver, that one that we've talked about a lot. I have a Rolex Date 840 in 18 karat yellow gold. And I have the Rolex Date Just. And of course, that's available in 36 or 41 millimeter sizes. So there's some versatility there. And then I have a Grand Seiko GMT SBGN 005, a 9F quartz movement. GMT watch that's 39 mils and 12 mils thick. And then the Rolex Yachtmaster 40 millimeter 116622 that we talked about the other day. And so first I'm going to go into the criteria of what what I think would make a great all-around one watch solution. And then why some of these watches check some of the boxes, but I don't think any of them check all the boxes. <clears throat> so, uh, did Sarah have a good show? I wanted to see it, but sadly, I was so tired, I dozed off and woke up after. There you go. Yeah, she did a good job. She did a good job. She didn't have as many... I'm surprised. She doesn't have as many viewers on her live shows as I have. I mean, I would rather watch her show than my show. I think it's more interesting. She talks about horses, all kinds of cool stuff, barrel racing, all that stuff. I think it's, I think it's a cool show. But I guess not enough people have discovered it yet. I guess it's about discovery. So give her time. Hopefully more people will discover her show and she'll get more, more viewers. Um, and she does a good job. She interacts with the chat. Uh, you know, she, I think she does a good job hosting the show. So, um, so yeah, Kyle Girls Live every Monday at 10 o'clock. Patrick's in the house. Okay, so let me go through the criteria for... A superb everyday. Now we're talking high-end watches here. We're not talking, you know, a hundred-dollar watch. We don't talk about hundred-dollar watches on this channel. It's just not a thing we do. And not that I have anything against hundred-dollar watches. I mean, they're great for what they do, but that's just not what we talk about on this channel. So we're talking about higher-end watches. And what? would constitute a fantastic wear all the time uh, Jack Nicholas watch. You know, he's been wearing his day date, day date, 36 mil day date for like 50 years or something, right? It was his only watch. I thought that was so cool, that interview of him. 
uh, yeah, this is my only watch. I, I've been wearing it. I got it, and I've been wearing it ever since. That's pretty freaking cool. Uh, let's see. I like Sarah's show. I have sleep issues and sometimes doze off early. I wanted to be there. Well, maybe next week. There is always next week. So, <clears throat> so here's the thing. Let me show a... Let me show the uh, the Grand Seiko here first. This is a pretty cool photo. <laughs> this is on their website. This is the GMT, and that's got the 9F movement, and that's so that so that allows it to only be 12 millimeters thick, which I think is one of the criteria of an everyday use all arounder. For me, at least, it can't be super thick because sometimes I'm wearing a dress shirt and I want it to be able to go under that cuff. I don't want it. You can expose it if you want to, right? You have that versatility, right? You can get the watch totally out and go that way, right? But I like to have the option of having it under the cuff. So that's where the thickness of the watch and the, and the overall size of the watch, too, comes into play. Thickness is probably the biggest of the of the attributes that, that you want to look at for that. So this one, this GMT, would definitely fit that bill. Very attractive looking watch. It's got loom, which I think is also important for a, a, an all the time, everyday use watch. I think you should have loom. I like accuracy, personally. I, I think that's a big criteria for a watch you're wearing all the time because that way you don't have to reset it often. You don't have to worry about it. You just know it's going to be accurate. So I'm keeping an eye on your comments while I'm going through these criteria. I saw some of your old videos when you had the Date 836 with President Ban. It was a very nice looking watch. Nothing will be as accurate as a Grand Seiko. Oh, I hear you, Scott. I hear you, Scott. Um, platinum Cellini, Craig, go platinum. <laughs> No, I wouldn't go platinum. I'd sooner go 18 karat yellow gold. Okay, so so thickness of the watch. We're talking about thickness. We're talking about accuracy. Comfort on wrist. And that's where this puppy comes in. The titanium diver is super comfortable on wrist because of the titanium, but now it's not thin enough. It's 14 mils thick, and I think you should have about a watch that's about 12 mils thick max for a uh, all-arounder. So I think that watch is too thick for an all-arounder. Now, for people that never wear shirt cuffs, then that's a non-issue. Okay? You can't beat an oyster case, turkey vulture. Okay, so let's go look at that. So we talked yesterday about the... The stunning yacht master <clears throat> and it's still got the beautiful oyster case that unfortunately the submariner does not have anymore and yet this has a lot of the benefits of a sub it's got the legibility that's another thing by the way that another criteria I think of a everyday all-around use watch I think it should have very good legibility in all lighting situations. And this one will do that. We'll have that. So, legibility. Obviously, look at that dial. I mean, very legible. So, of course, as is that dial. So, this one, going back to the uh, Yacht Master discussion, it's again nice and thin. It's less than 12 mils thick by most measurements by most people that have done reviews on it. So, uh, let's see, Omega Apollo 11. You're right on the Oyster case, there you go. And so the Yacht Master is definitely in the running. Now, um, the, some of the other watches that were on the list were, let's see, let me search Datejust on here. date just and I don't think I'm going to differentiate between the 36 and the 41 right now in this search 
I'm just going to search Datejust in general. And let's see what we come up with. I'll see if I come up with something interesting that looks like... Okay, here's one. Here's a Datejust 41. And with that blue dial, that looks like it's got pretty good contrast. Not quite as much contrast with the hands as I would like. I'd like a little more loom on those hands to give a little more contrast. The 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 hash marks for the, for the hour markers look look like they've got they stand out very nicely. But I'm not sure if that would be as legible. Certainly, I don't think it would be as legible as the Yacht Master. But see there, it's got a nice slim case, nice slender case. I think they're less than 12 mils, just a hair less than 12 millimeters. And it's got that beautiful oyster case. Um, let's see here. The Grand Seiko Snowflake is 12 millimeters thick. No, I think it's 12 and a half. I think the Snowflake is 12 and a half. The SVGA275 with the solid case back is 11 millimeters thick. Uh, you might want to double check some of those numbers. You might be off a little bit on that. I had the snowflake and it definitely was not shirt cuffable for me at least. Um, and, and here's another criteria coming to you. Another criteria coming to you is micro adjustments. I want micro adjustments and, and my diver has them. It has four micro adjustments on the bracelet and then of course it has the extension mechanism too but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the being able to adjust the bracelet when the temperature changes, the seasons change, and you might want a little bit of adjustment in that bracelet without having to take links out, right? Whether the links are pins or screws, it's still a pain in the neck to take, take links in and out and all that. I like to have the micro adjustments, and that's getting to be not as many watches have that. A lot of the date justs with the hidden clasp Jubilee bracelet don't have it. Now, the Yacht Master does. It's got the micro adjustment. So that's a big thumbs up on the micro adjustment on that. Of course, a date eight, and we'll get to that in a minute. The date eight forty is also on the consideration list. Of course, it doesn't have the micro adjustments. See where we've got trade offs here on everything. N nothing seems to be perfect across the line. Checking all the boxes. Uh, let's see. Did you see the gold Seamaster? Yes, I did. Yeah. I would, I would take a pass on that. I, I, it looked okay, but yeah, I wouldn't be a player for that one. Let's see. The more I look at the 18 karat Yacht Master, the more I like it. Our wags. So the all gold Yacht Master. Uh, can you put the model number in the chat for that, and I'll pull it up. Let's see here. Polished center links are non-starter for... See, see, that's the other issue. Yeah, see what I mean? All of these watches, there's always some issue, right? You, you, you think you've found the perfect watch. Um, where is the Yacht Master? Let's go back to the... Um, let's go back to the Yacht Master. Let's see here. Uh, oh, let me add this to the to my wish list, the Jubilee, the uh, date just so that we can go back to it if we need to. But anyway, in the meantime, I'm going to go back to my, they call it the notepad on Chrono 24. And um, so, so, yeah, that's the thing with this stunning Yacht Master. You have to put up with the polished center links. Okay, so so again, there's always something. There's always something. Now this watch, it's a very attractive watch. I mean, let's not let's not beat around the bush here. I think it's a stunning watch for for a steel watch. I'm not a big fan, as you know, of of steel watches, but with that platinum bezel and with that blue dial. And it just, that stunning oyster case, it's a very attractive watch. So I could probably look the other way as far as the, the polished center links.
But what's hard for me to look the other way on is the accuracy, the lack of accuracy. I'm so spoiled with the spring drive, I don't know if I can go back to a regular mechanical watch. That is a big, big issue. Uh, let's see. What are you wearing as dress watch now? Space Time says, I'm wearing the Apple Watch. Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm wearing the Apple Watch right now. And it's only, it's less than 11 mils thick. So it's very compact, the, the Apple Watch. And the way this bracelet is designed, you, I think you can see, it's hard for me to keep it in focus. If I get too close to the camera, it's not going to be in focus. But it's very, very close to the wrist. It's got a nice amount of thickness to it, the, the bracelet. But it's, but it, it sits very trim. And the, the bottom part is, see how flush to the wrist it is? I mean, they got a lot of things right with the Apple Watch. I know there's a lot of people that are haters on the Apple Watch, but this is Series 1, and they got a lot of things right. Uh, and it's only gotten better since then. So um, the Grand Seiko clasp adjustment is cheap-looking compared to the rest of the watch. On the Diver, it... it it works great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to fault the clasp mechanism at all. When I first got it, yeah, I didn't like the looks of it. It was a little bit bulbous and stuff like that. And yeah, it could have looked better, but it's so functional. The functionality of it is so good that that has just totally won me over with, for actual daily use. Again, none of what we're talking about here applies to people that are just collecting them and have them in the box on a shelf or in a safe or in a safety deposit box or whatever. None of what this discussion applies to that. That This discussion all has to do with using the watch on a daily basis, on a regular basis, day in, day out. That's what this discussion is about. So, so it's a little bit different discussion than, than some people would have. Um, Yachtmaster is a classy sub dressier and richier steel and platinum yeah i think it well especially with that case the 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 maxi case on the sub is just just downright like the ugly duckling of the group i mean it's just like like they just screwed that watch up uh let's see here craig my yacht was slow and took 11 minutes for the regatta so i couldn't use my ym2 <laughs> My yacht was slow. It took 11 minutes, but okay. Um, 50, 50 Fathoms is next on my list to get. Then VC overseas, way later down the road. I'll call it a day for collecting. Yeah, I, I, like I've said before uh, on the channel, I don't get the collecting thing. I mean, I, I buy my watches to use them. But hey, it's it's each their own. Some people like to collect stuff. I mean, that's okay. Um, but I just don't uh, get it as far as watches go. I buy watches to use them. But okay, so back to the discussion here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Craig is generally not a fan of chronographs. Yeah, I don't need them. I, I don't need the chronograph functionality. So, yeah, I, I would pass on that. Uh, I think one steel watch and one thin gold watch might be your best bet. I don't think you'll get everything you want in one watch. You might be right. You might be right. I might have to stick with the rotation I have now. I might have to wear the Apple Watch as my dress watch. And... and and all other times where the the Grand Seiko Spring Drive. Um, I might have to do that. Let's see. Uh, it's accurate enough. Uh, uh, as long as you don't get... Um, okay. Oh, stop. It's accurate enough, Craig. Uh, what's accurate enough? Which watch are you referring to? Better stick with GS if you're concerned with accuracy. I hear you, Richard. Two seconds a day is good enough. Uh, I don't know about that. That's that's a couple minutes in a month. That's, that's a lot. Um, at a red light, the Apple Watch, like quartz, has no soul. Uh, 
Apple Watch is pretty freaking cool. I'll tell you, it's pretty freaking cool. That's a Series 1. Yes, a Series 1. Yeah, it runs great. And, and, and it holds the battery charge well. Um, still goes all day long. I still usually have like 50% of battery left at the end of the day when I put it on the charger. So, yeah, it's still working great. I would buy a Series 1 Apple Watch if it would work with my Samsung S7, but it will not communicate with it there, Series 1. Yeah, 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 yeah you got to be Apple all the way. Yeah, you got to have an iPhone and all that, but I'm Apple all the way. I wouldn't punish myself by having an Android phone. I'm not, I'm not into, like, you know, self-mutilation and pain and all that stuff. Uh, why not a Calatrava? Yeah, see, I thought about a Calatrava. But again, I would definitely be in a two-watch rotation then because I wouldn't see the Calatrava as a sport watch, as being able to really take a beating and, and roll into that role, okay? I, I, I don't think a Calatrava is that. And so that, that's why I've kind of dismissed any of the exotic watches that are a little more fragile. And of course, I'd have to get a Calatrava on a bracelet because you're not going to go swimming with a Calatrava with a leather strap, right? So you'd have to get one of the ones that has a screw-down crown that, that has a gold bracelet. Now you're way up there in price, and I don't see the benefit. I think you probably would be just better off going with a Date 840 at that point. Um, so that's the thought process there. You already have... A timekeeping queen king. It's called the Apple Watch. Yeah, the, this yeah, this Apple Watch <laughs> works great. It really does. I have a, I have six solid pieces now and wear them all the time. The watch lines. Maybe it's time to consolidate down to maybe one watch. Probably if you sold five of them or sold old all six, you could probably get something really spectacular, and then just wear it all the time. Do a Jack Nicholas. Do a Jack Nicholas, man. Just wear that watch all the time. Uh, you use and consume stuff instead of tying up money into stuff sitting around. Craig, you would make a terrible wine collector. <laughs> Absolutely, I would not make a good wine collector. First of all, I don't drink wine, so yeah. Um, there's that. I mean, I occasionally will have a glass of wine if I'm with dinner, dinner out or something with somebody and they offer me a glass of wine. I'll have, I mean, you know, I wouldn't refuse it, but I, I wouldn't spend my own money on it. I'll put it that way. Uh, let's see. A fine gentleman like yourself needs a dress watch and Apple, Apple Watch just won't cut it. It's pretty damn cool. Pretty cool. And see, I'm in the technology business, too. So if I roll in and I've got an Apple Watch on, then you know, it's very understandable. It's not, it's, it's not an issue uh, because that's kind of the business that I'm in. So it's not a, it really is not a negative. I actually wore this watch for two years when I first got it. It was my daily wear. And I really liked it, keeping track of the exercise, my walking and all that, and keeping track of the calories and all that. That was cool. And then I went back to uh, regular watches, and then I've been back and forth. Uh, but, yeah, I have nothing against the uh, Apple Watch. I gave it a very good review when I first got it. The quality of them is just fantastic. I mean, they're just this link bracelet, the, the fit and finish and everything, and the comfort of it on wrist is just fantastic. And, and again, this is Series 1. But the link bracelet was like 400 bucks or something. I think I think it's a little bit more, a little bit less expensive now. I think it's about 350 now for the stainless steel link bracelet. Just the bracelet, you know, not the watch. Uh, let's see here. It would be hard to beat the Rolex Oyster Perpetual black dial as a one watch all arounder. That's a good point. Let's try to pull that up. Oyster Perpetual. And what model number would be the best one to take a look at? Let me know in the chat. 
if there's a preferred model number. Let's see here. Okay, here's one with a black dial. Oh, that's a 34 mil. Yeah, I don't think I'd go for the 34. Now, here's a 39. Here's a 39 mil Oyster Perpetual. And that's got loom. That is pretty freaking cool. And that's only about 11 mils, isn't it? Let me know in the chat how thick that puppy is. Original box and papers. Let's go through the photos on this puppy. I should have put this on the thumbnail instead of the date just. Now, the one thing about this that is a little bit of an issue is, believe it or not, that smooth bezel is more likely to scratch and, and show battle scars than the fluted bezel on a date just. But that's not the end of the world. That's not the end of the world. Certainly is not the end of the world. So, and it still has a pretty good looking case. Pretty good looking lugs on that. And I like the fact that it's all brushed. Yeah, that would be a good all arounder. Now, it has three micro adjustments in the class, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong on that in the chat. So, Oyster Perpetual. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh -huh, he doesn't drink, so I would agree. I'm not sure what you're agreeing with. It's, um, okay. Uh, well... Lounge, cut down to one watch. Craig, if Rolex comes out with a new gold sub with 70-hour power reserve and a trimmer case, would you consider it? Um, hmm. I don't know. It would probably have polished center links. So I would probably go with the Date 8 instead. The Date 8, the President bracelet holds up great because of the way it's designed, because of the way each of the links are curved. Nothing gets a straight hit on it to scratch it. You know, so it really, over time, it holds up really well. So there's a huge advantage to the President bracelet when you're looking at an all gold watch, either the President bracelet or Jubilee. They both hold up really well because of the curved. See, flat surfaces, big flat surfaces of gold that are high polished, like you have on the Oyster, any little thing that hits that, you're going to see that. It's going to show up. So that's an issue. Um, let's see here. Blue Shirt Buddha says, um, get a Day Date 40, the perfect one, and done watch. You might be right. Let's see. Craig, if you're saving for the Prevost, maybe you should... You maybe you put the 18k stunner money in the motor coach and bag the watch purchase. You've been there, done that with the watches. Uh, Casio G Shock every day, blah blah. blah. We'll look at a Prevost here in a minute. I was looking at one the other day. There's a really nice one on Prevost stuff. I'll show you to, to you guys. It's really cool. I was tempted, man. Uh, just get a gold day date 840, the perfect watch one and done. Okay, I read that. 1114300. Okay. We'll do that one. 114300. And then we'll look at the Pre Prevo. You guys are going to love the one that's on Prevo stuff. It's really freaking cool. Yeah, so it's a 39 mil. So, yeah, that's the same one we just looked at. Nice watch. But, again, I'd be giving up the accuracy. Uh, let's see. Just bought another great daily watch from my AD, Rolex. 116710 black bezel GMT. Well, there you go. 
email Craig a picture. Okay, absolutely. And let me know when it's emailed. I'll, I'll pull it up. Bought it yesterday. We'll pick it up Tuesday. I'll, I'll throw it on my channel soon. Okay, cool. Yes, the OP39 has three micro adjustments. There you go. Oyster Petrol is 11 millimeters thick. A friend of mine has the white doll. He loves it. I guess he does. One watch only is boring. I don't think so. No, because then you can focus on other things like, like, um, like Wag said, the, the Prevo. <laughs> and like cashmere sport coats and stuff. This one's really comfortable. Really nice freaking cashmere. When the women like put their arms around you and stuff, they feel the cashmere. They like, they purr. They purr. Um, get one GS GMT and one Rolex Stunner. Uh, this is my sixth Rolex GM th GMT. I'm thinking it will be my favorite because it's the most, uh, it is the most to lie of them all. I'm not sure what you meant by that, but okay. The Oyster Spiritual Dinner is a great looking watch as a one watch solution. I hear you. Watches to me are like cars. The moment I get one, I'm already lusting for the next, Yankee Doodle says. Uh, 39 millimeter, you'll get bored of it after a week. I don't get bored of things. I, I like my gear. I, I get gear, I use it. Congratulations, Dream Machine. Okay. Um, I have a car and a watch problem. There, Therefore, I have a wife problem. Have you tried on a Submariner with the Maxi case? I, I, was, I went and looked at one. He, Steve had one, and I did a video on it. It's on my channel, and I held it in my hand. I looked it over and all that. No, I'm a, that's a non-starter for me. I don't think it's attractive. I really don't. I don't like the slab sides. I don't like the big lugs. I don't like anything about it. I think the Yachtmaster case is is stunning compared to it. Um, I was going to show you that mess, but I've already put the pulled that down. But it, you 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 saw it. It's it's. Oh, well, let's go and look at it. Let's let's look at the Yachtmaster again here. For those who might not have seen it. For those who might not have seen how absolutely. Stunning. The yacht master case is. So, let's do this. Let's click on this and let's go through the photos. Oh, come on! Is there only one photo on here? How did I happen to pick one that only has one photo? Don't you hate that when they put a watch in here and they only have one freaking photo? I mean, you know, come on! You're trying to sell a watch for. I picked the more expensive one on purpose because I figured they'd have a lot of photos, right? But I figured wrong. So, yeah. Let's get a side view on that case. Well, that's a little bit of a view. You can see how it, how it curves and how sensual it looks. But that's not They don't have a side view. I'll tell you what. These people, they're trying to sell watches. They don't even know how to get a photograph of a freaking watch. Um... Craig, next financial crisis is coming soon. Take care. Okay, I'll be ready. I, I got money on the sidelines. I'm ready to buy. I'm ready to buy stuff cheap. Uh, I'm wearing one of my GMTs now, Pepsi Jubilee. It has a lot of pop, so I think it will appreciate. I think I will appreciate the lower key, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, solution. Retire and move to Florida, then give all your suits to Goodwill, and then wear what you want. You're welcome. There you go. Um, I emailed you a pic. Okay, we'll pull it up. I had the same Toyota truck for 30 years. I was never bored. It got stolen two years ago by drug addicts. Uh-oh. It was my daily driver. Yeah, Toyotas are great. I'm in total agreement over the Rolly Maxi case. It's like a fat woman squeezed into a bikini. Oh, my gosh. And you see that down in Florida, too. It's really disgusting. It's really disgusting. And the Yacht Master traded it for Daytona a couple years ago. Oh. Sad. To, sorry to hear that. Uh, test, uh, test driver Mercedes. Read the re reliability reviews. Weep. Get, out, get it out of your mind and go buy a Lexus. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy a Mercedes. Not on a bet. I'd absolutely buy the Lexus. That's what I bought. I've owned several of them. 
Love my Daytona, but once I got the stainless steel ceramic uh, black dial, I knew I had to get the white one. Okay, absolutely. Lexo Mercedes. Hope I get a call soon. Lexus is the best car made. There you go. Okay, let's look at the Prevo. I just looked at one the other day. And I mean, I don't need it. I'm not ready, ready for it right now because I'm not ready to start traveling again. Uh, I got some housekeeping things to deal with before I'm really ready to buy one. But that said, I was really tempted by this, this one. I'm going to pull it up here. Give me a, give me a little bit of time to, to pull it up because you guys are going to like this one. This one's nice, 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 nice. Uh, make sure I get the right one here. And what's important is this one has the over-the-road Prevo air conditioning, which is really cool. Um, let's see if I can find the correct one. It's either this one, let me open this, open them both. I'll open them both and make sure I get the correct one. I think it's this one, but let me just make sure before I show you. Make sure it's got that huge compressor on the engine. That's how you can tell that it's got the over the road air conditioning. Da, 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 da. Just checking to make sure, folks. Bear with me. Don't don't anybody panic. I'll let you know when it's time to panic. Nope, that's not it. It's the next one. I think it's this one. Uh, yeah, I believe it's this one. Let me make sure. Because I looked at both of them. They were similarly priced. And then I noticed the one didn't have the over-the-road air conditioning. It had some little funky aftermarket air conditioning compressor on the engine. And so I said, no, we're going to skip that. Okay, this is the one. Okay. So I'm going to show you guys this one. Okay. Uh, first, I'm going to check the um, comments. And then we'll go through this one real quick here. Um, let's see. I, I drive a Toyota because it's good enough for the terrorists. They, I can't stand anything Asian. I'll take a Mercedes. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's not a good move. Craig, do you think a GS is a good choice for first luxury watch? If you can find the one that you really like that really meets all your needs, be very picky. Look them over. Make sure you get the one that you really like. Measure seven times. Cut once. Isis does not drive Mercedes. Yeah. Scott Kilmore says to buy Toyota or Lexus, both are the same company, really. I think he tells the truth. Yeah, of course they're both the same. Same. But Lexus is just, a, is just a luxury Toyota, that's all. Mercedes and BMWs also have a bunch of stuff going wrong. Yeah, I would skip the Mercedes and BMWs. Um, let's see. In the USA, most Mercedes and BMWs are made in Mexico. Now, if you were in Germany, bought them... Uh, in Germany, they're built much better. Yeah, I'd skip those. I had a bunch of Mercedes that were made in Germany. They're, they still give trouble. The Toyota or Lexus are still much better. Um, I'd say Toyota or Lexus. Now, I wouldn't say is the Rolex of vehicles. I'd say they're the Grand Seikos of vehicles because they're better than a Rolex. Um, just watch uh, Scotty Kilmer's video explaining why you shouldn't buy a Mercedes. Ridiculous engineering decisions to what you made to make. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they get it so wrong. Okay, let's go through this Prevo. This thing is freaking... This is cool, man. This is just cool. All I'm, oh, that's all I'm going to tell you. This is a Prevost Liberty XL. Liberty, a lot of the Liberties... Uh, by the way, that's like top-of-the-line converter of Prevo buses into RVs is Liberty. And a lot of them will have the Prevo over-the-road air conditioning. Um, and to me, that's a key. That's, that's a critical thing. Um, and this one, they, they've got all the documentation. They've known the coach for many years. And so 
it's probably a stand up, jumping up and down coach. I won't buy one unless it really is stand up. I mean, it's got to be garage kept since new. It's got to be super well maintained. Otherwise, I would I would pass. And and you will find these that are just stand up coaches in this price range for this for the for this year range. And this is the year. This, these are towards the end of the non-slide units, and I want a non-slide unit. I don't want the slide out, so those potentially give trouble, and I don't need them. And so I'd get a non-slide coach. You get a lot more coach for the money. And so we'll go on through these photos here real quick. And I would probably put my office up front here. I would take out one or both of the couches, and this is where I would put my mobile office. I don't know if you've seen how I have the current coach set up with the mobile office and all that, um, but that's what I did with it. I have the office up front, and uh, and so that's what I would do here. Of course, it would be real nice. But anyway, there's a just a little dining area, kitchen, kitchen, and they just replaced this, the refrigerator. There's the washer and dryer, shower, da, 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 da. there's the rear compartment, and that's probably a queen size, or it might even be king, but it's probably a queen size custom bed. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, that's looking back from the bedroom forward. And there's the commode. And uh, that's looking from the kitchen forward. And the other good thing is these have a lot of storage underneath. So I can get all my camera gear in there and everything. No problem. I can carry all my gear with me. And there's another outside shot. And uh, you can see the compartments, the storage compartments. Three-quarter view from the side. And I would not buy one if it ever had any paint work or anything like that. It had to be all original. This one's all original. And you can tell if that paint is really, really nice like that, you can tell it's been kept inside. So you want one that's always been kept inside. That's the key. That way they don't... And now here's the, here's the, the real tell. You see there... To the right of that, of the main engine, the Detroit diesel, see that huge compressor? That's for the over-the-road air conditioning. And what's really cool about that is, literally cool, that'll keep your whole bus like, like you could hang meat in it. that keep your whole bus cool, no matter how hot it is outside. And you're not running your other air conditioning systems that are you know, built into the bus. To, when you're parked, you're typically going to use the... Um, the uh, built-in air conditioners, separate you know, air conditioners that run off of 110, right? They can run off the generator or off shore power. But when you're running down the road, you don't want to have to run your generator and, and all that. And so the neat thing about having the over-the-road air conditioning is it's plenty powerful enough to keep the whole coach cool and uh, just run off the engine. And it's really a nice system. It's super quiet. You don't even hear it inside the way they vent them and all. They're really, really cool. They're very expensive. Uh, it's a very expensive option, and a lot of the buses don't have it. So you want to make sure that they had the over-the-road air conditioning. Okay, so let's see. Let's look at the comments. Um, let's see here. Um, just watched Scotty Kilmer's video explaining why you should not buy them. Okay, I already read that. Love the stainless steel on the Prevost. Really stand. Yeah, oh yeah, it's cool. I prefer the air condition in my in my vehicle, not over the road. <laughs> uh, new new Mercedes are garbage. Older ones are the best cars ever made. I have a 2004 E Class with over 200,000 miles, and it runs like the day I bought it. They also dominate F1. Yeah, but, uh, you know, Toyota's a better car still. Um, Liberty over Marathon Craig. Well, that's a good discussion. 
There are, you will find some marathons that will have uh, the over the road air conditioning, but not as common. They didn't put it in all of them. A lot of the Liberties will have it. Uh, so, yeah, some of the marathons, Marathon is a good maker and they're okay. They're not as high end, not quite as high end as Liberty. And so, yeah, it would depend on the coach uh, on that. But there's nothing wrong with a marathon if you can find one with the over-the-road air conditioning. And a lot of times, if they have the over-the-road air conditioning, they'll have the cruise air, air conditioning units for, for when you're parked. And the cruise airs are down in the belly of the bus. And a lot of people don't like that because it uses some of the storage space. But typically, the cruise airs are quieter. So when you're running the roof airs, even though they're insulated and all that, and they vent them, they're careful about it and all that, but it's a little bit noisier than the uh, cruise air units that are typically down in the belly of the coach. Um, and now cruise airs are expensive to service and expensive to replace and all that, but if they're serviced properly and if they're in good shape, they, they're pretty robust. They're, they're what people put on yachts, uh, cruise airs. Um, so I'd probably like to have one with the over-the-road air conditioning and the cruise airs. Would probably be also you have less, fewer holes in the roof because when you have the roof-mounted air conditioning units, of course, there's more holes in the roof, right? Um, so and they look kind of ugly. All those air conditioners across the top. You see, some of them have like four air conditioners across the top. Now the advantage to have the air conditioners on the top is they're much cheaper to. If one fails, it's very easy to replace it. And they're not that expensive. You know, a thousand bucks, you can probably replace one. Whereas a cruise air unit, you're probably going to spend at least five grand uh, to replace it, maybe 10. Um, let's see here. Uh, slides on motorhomes are the number one maintenance problem. Nothing worse than getting ready to go and your slides won't retract. Start of a bad day. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, but most RVs are junk anyway, so yeah. But the, the slides they put on Prevos are pretty good usually. There are some of the early ones weren't quite as good, but the factory slides that you get on a, a Prevo, if you get one with the factory slides, they're pretty good. But it's not, I don't need it. I, I, there's no, I have no need for it. So just like a chronograph, with the chronograph functional, I don't need it, so I'm not going to get it. I, I just don't want something to potentially give trouble that I don't really have a need for. Um... Idea for a TV show, uh, Ship on the Road, Craig Travels Around, Rodeos in the Midwest, and all. Well, yeah, I've done all of the above. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of stuff from the road. Um, go back in my channel, I've done a lot of broadcasts from the road. Not as much live stuff, but back, back then we didn't have enough bandwidth, but yeah, videos. Um, <clears throat> What are RV slides? So slide out is the, the side of the coach slides out like three or four feet when you park. The, the whole side slides out, so it gives you more room inside the coach. Um, that's the idea behind them. <clears throat> uh, let's see. That's what I call a Prevo stunner. I guess it is. Toyotas are not better cars than Mercedes. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> they're much better car. Not even a close call. Um, let's see here. That's what people who say can't afford a Mercedes. Yeah, right. I've, I've had Mercedes. I had several of them. And now I had them back in the day when they really were good, except they had a rust problem. I had the 240Ds. I had a couple of 300Ds, 300 diesels. I had a 300SD. Now, I had a 450 SEL, and that was... A time bomb. I, I, I sold that before it had a chance to give trouble. I also had a 6.3, a Mercedes a 300 SEL 6.3. That was made probably before you were born. Uh, it was a 19, I think it was a 1970 model, right thereabouts. Um, so yeah, I had a number of Mercedes vehicles. And the problem with them back then was they had a rust problem. That was the biggest problem. The diesels, like the 300 SD, that's a that's a two, three, four hundred thousand mile car, uh, and the 240D and the 300D, same thing. You can drive them for multiple hundreds of thousands of miles. They were pretty robust, pretty bulletproof, but they were also very simple uh, vehicles. 
uh, n not anywhere near as complicated as what you have these days. They didn't have any computer systems on them or anything. So you could just run those cars. But that's back in the day. That's not now. Now they're a bag of hurt. You buy a Mercedes now and you're just rolling the dice. You're just taking your chances. You're playing Russian roulette. So, yeah, you're talking to a guy that's had all of the above. Don't take my advice, though. That's okay. You don't have to take my advice. I'm sharing with you decades' worth of advice and experience. I was in the car business for many years, and I'm sharing my advice and my knowledge. You can just disregard it. That would be a smart thing to do. Just disregard it. Greetings from Atlanta. My old neighbor had one like that. The slide went out, and he hauled his... And he hauled his 63 split window vet around going to different car shows behind. There you go. Most people who buy newer Mercedes, BMWs, and Audis and, and throw them away after three years tops, they're engineered to be reliable for 50,000 miles and then dumped. <laughs> Chris, Chris, watch out for the wrench gang. Uh-oh, there is the wrench gang. <laughs> the wrench gang's getting that, getting that wrench ready. Uh-oh. So, yeah, the Prevo, I mean, that's a beast. That is a beast, okay? Um, and that will be my next coach. That's the only thing I can get to step up from my Bluebird. My Bluebird Wander Lodge. Uh, let's see. Fair enough. No disrespect. What's a better, what's a better car? A used Corvette Z06 or CTS-V? Yeah, I don't know the newer stuff. I don't know the models on those Corvettes, but um, I would be kind of scared of some of the Corvettes from a maintenance issue, too. I, I don't know that I'd be all, o all over those. Audi is another money pit car. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, and you want money pit. Go Volvo. Go Saab. I mean, you know, you really want to take it up the you-know-what. Just get, get one of those. Um What's your opinion on smart cities? Do you think cash will be replaced with, fi what's that, fin Fintican? <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Um, I think Bitcoin is the future. I'm a holder of Bitcoin. I'm a long-term holder. Another guy said on the comments the other day, he says, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He owns Bitcoin. Hey, my Bitcoin has gone up a lot over the years. I don't know. I don't know what you're thinking, but I I've done very good on Bitcoin. I already sold enough back in the day that I'm playing with the, the house's money right now. I'm ahead. So even if it went to zero right now, I I'm still ahead. So you know, I don't know what you're thinking, but your math isn't real good. Uh, I started buying Bitcoin when it was thirty dollars a coin. So. And I was talking about it back then, and you guys didn't listen to me. That's your own damn fault. I talked about it. I didn't talk about it often because most times when I brought it up, people thought I was a total nutcase. Um, now it's been around 10 years, and they still think I'm a total nutcase. But that's okay. When it's around another 10 years, and it's like $100,000 a coin, then, then they'll probably still call me a nutcase. Uh, let's see here. That's what I should do. I should wait till it goes up to 150000 a coin and buy the Prevo with one Bitcoin. So then I can say I paid $30 for the, for the Prevo. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, Audi has really dropped the ball on cool cars nowadays and basically just make vanilla crossovers now. Okay. Um, let's see. I'd buy a 911. If, if, you know, if, if so I was thinking about spending money on a vet, there are some 911s you can buy. Some of the less popular ones, um, like from the around 2005 or so, I forget there was a series there that they just weren't quite as popular. They're still really good cars. And you can get a nice one for like 25, 26, maybe 28 grand, a 911. Uh, that's what I would do. 
course, make sure you get a nice one. But some of those Porsche people keep them in the garage and really pamper them, and they're just really nice cars. That's what you would want to buy. I'd skip the Corvette and buy the 911. Personally, that's what I would do. Hey, great, great show. Can you name a time? Uh, can you name a time? When is your advice not 100% correct? Why would I give advice and not have it be correct? That would be counterproductive. I'd feel really bad if I gave you advice and it was not good advice. My gosh, why would I ever do that? So, yeah, no, I wouldn't do that to you. If I'm not sure about something, I will say I have no idea. I'll come right out and say I don't know. But if I'm sure about it, I'll tell you that too. And, of course, I'm going to be right because I'm not going to say that unless I'm sure about it. I mean, why would I do that to you guys? What's in it for me? Uh, throw a cam on one of the supercharged versions. There you go. Well, some of the some of the stock cars right now coming out have 600 horsepower on them. If you want horsepower, I don't think you need that much horsepower, though. Okay, uh, let's get right back into it here, and we're going to wrap this puppy up fairly soon. I never even heard of Bitcoin until a year ago. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. That's a shame. But it's still not late. It's still not too late. I mean, Bitcoin has still got a long way to go, I think. Um, that's okay. The, the, worst, the worst they could, could you is a nutcase with a Bitcoin bank. Okay. But I, not sure exactly what you mean there, but that's okay. They all laughed at Christopher Columbus when he said the world was round. Yeah, they did. <clears throat> But see, uh, 911 is another money pit car. That's why they, not necessarily. If you get a good one, they're not, they're not that bad. They're pretty robust, actually. But you've got to get a good one. Um, here's, here's the thing. I have a track record of people laughing at me on different societal shifts, okay? When the Internet came around. And I was, like, buying up a bunch of domain names. Like, I bought racingcar.com. I bought series.com. I bought a whole bunch of domain names, most of which I've sold. I still own maybe a 1,000 of them. But I was buying a bunch of domain names. And that back then, it was $70 each. So you had to pay for two years. You had to go through Network Solutions because they were the only ones you could register a domain name through. They had a monopoly. And you had to pay $70 for two years registration, Right for each domain name. So I was registering domain names, a bunch of them, right? And I told my family about it. I said, listen, hey, this is going to be big, this internet thing. And if you've got some good domain names, you're going to be able to sell them and make a good profit on them. Oh, why would I do that? You know, what's a domain name? Blah, blah, blah. You're crazy. They're $70 each. Why would I do that? And it was about two or three years later, maybe four years later, that I sold one for 50 grand. Okay, one domain name. And then they said, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this domain name thing? <laughs> I said, well, first of all, there aren't that many good ones left. <laughs> That's number one. And so, yeah, um, they missed out on that one, too. Uh, let's see here. Uh no, you're right. My point is that crypto is on is on one side good, but banks like J.P. Morgan screw it up. You see, he won't be able to. Uh, he, they, they're screwed, really, because the neat thing about Bitcoin is that they're coming late to the party. It's already very decentralized. It's already all over the world. The cat's out of the bag, if you will. There's nodes all around the world. So it's too late for them to kill it. So now all they can do is try to compete with it, and they can't really compete with it because they don't have anything to offer to compete with it. And so they're pretty much screwed long term. They, 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 they are, uh, 
what all they're going to be able to do is offer services on top of Bitcoin. In other words, offer like custodial services where they'll hold your Bitcoin for you, loan Bitcoin and do things, you know, they can just do some things on top of Bitcoin. But it's too late for them to control Bitcoin. It's too late for them to get a big stake in Bitcoin at a low cost, right? They can't, in other words, they can't buy it for like 10 cents a Bitcoin anymore or 20 cents or $2 or whatever, you know, which they could have if they got in way back at the beginning. They can't do that anymore. It's too late, right? So they're too late to the party. The cat's out of the bag. And um, it's going to be a problem for them. It's going to be a problem for some of the governments, too. Some of the corrupt governments that like to devalue their currencies and control the currencies and do all like Venezuela and all that. It's going to be a real problem for a lot of these people. I think. And I think it'll be cool to sit back and watch it all happen. I think it's going to be funny. Um, let's see here. Uh, performance on Lexus is poor. My, uh, my LS430 <laughs> ran great. It had plenty of power. It, it, was, it was nice. Uh, MR2s are robust if you get a good one like that. <laughs> Yeah, you, you you really don't want to buy a used car that you don't know the history of and that you don't really, I mean, it's just like buying a used watch. You, you don't want to buy a watch that's been around and you don't know anything about it and somebody may have monkeyed around with it that doesn't know what they're doing. I mean, you know, I, I just, that's why if I buy a Prevo, I'm going to have the complete history of it, the complete service history of it. I'm going to have it thoroughly checked out at a Prevo service center. I mean, I'm going to do my due diligence to make sure I get the right coach. Now with those, it's not as difficult because they they usually fall into one of two classes. They're usually a really well maintained, you know, sometimes even a one owner coach, where you can see the garage it's been kept in and everything. And I mean, it's just pretty apparent that it's been well cared for. Or it's a coach that's been around with a bunch of owners and it's been outside a lot and all that. You can tell pretty quick when you start examining them. Uh, that it's a ni really nice coach or it's not. It's, it's usually one of those things. And I'm going to buy one that's just stand up, that's just jumping up and down like new. Uh, and I'll pay a premium for it. I'll pay, you know, if I could get the same year model for a hundred grand that's been like dogged and, and been outside and not that great a condition, I'll pay an extra 50 grand. I'll pay 150 grand to get the cream puff. And that's what, what Clive should have done. He should have, instead of trying to get a deal, he should have paid up and gotten a real cream puff. Gotten one with like 60,000 original miles, always garage kept, one owner, just a jumping up and down, beautiful car, and paid a couple grand more. Because in the long run, you're going to pay anyway. If you get the dog, you're going to end up putting that money back in it anyway, and you still have a dog. You just have a fixed dog. That's what we used to always do with cars. We used to always buy the jumping up and down, just gorgeous freaking garage kept car, and we came out ahead doing it that way. But it's the way you go. Hey, Craig, which YouTuber you feel is smarter than you? <laughs> Tim, when it comes to watches, most of them know more about watches than me. I don't know that much about watches. I'm just a user of watches. I'm not a... You know, I, I don't, I'm not a collector. I'm not a, a, really a dealer or any of that. I mean, I, these guys, a lot of them have a lot more knowledge about uh, that stuff than me. Uh, you have no way of knowing the future of Bitcoin is purely speculative. That's correct. Absolutely, it's speculation. But what you do with anything, with any speculative investment, is you look at as much information as you can get, and you, you calculate... You know, what are my chances of success? And like right now, if I was thinking about investing in Bitcoin right now, what I would look at is I would look at the track record. It's been around 10 years. I'd look at the track record. I'd look at the developers that are working on it. I'd look at what big players are putting money in the space, like Fidelity is in investing in the space. I'd, I'd look at what's going on in the ecosystem. I'd look at the number of transactions that are going on and if that's on the upswing or not. I'd look at all these data points 
and then I would decide how risky the investment is. That's how you assess the, the risk, right? And I'd say, okay, if I'm going to spend $3,800 on a Bitcoin, what, what is the risk that that's going to go to zero and I'm going to lose $3,800? Is that likely? And, and I'm going to calculate that. And then what is the chance that it's going to go up significantly? And I'm going to make my best guess on that, right? And then armed with that information, I'm going to decide, do I want to put some money in this thing? That, that's how I look at any investment. And the thing about Bitcoin is I would not want to be left out of the game. I, I, I would not want to have nothing in there. Uh, I mean, at a minimum, I'd buy one Bitcoin just, just, to be, just to hedge my bets in case it takes off, in case it becomes a big deal. I'd want to at least have one because if you don't have any, then there's nothing you can do five years from now when it's gone up to, you know, 60 grand or whatever it is, right? You, you can't go back in time and, and buy it at $3,800. Um, so it's, it's a real problem for people that don't have any Bitcoin. I, I think it's going to be a real problem for them. But we'll see. Time will tell. Time will tell. Tim, as I should have a watch off with Han Danes. There you go. And also, Tim gives a lot of sage advice. He really does. And he'll be the first one to say you shouldn't borrow money to buy a watch and, and all these things. I mean, he's, he's a smart guy. He's no joke. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I meant, uh, let's see, okay. Let's see here. Um, performance, performance on Lexus is not poor. Okay. Um, I already read that one. Okay, I read that one. I read that Okay. Do you know when Stephen Little Treasure was doing some more live streams? He, got, he, he did get a new uh, Video Pro streaming box, and he's playing with it, trying to get it working and everything. And then he's going to go to Basel World. So I don't know if he's going to have it, everything working before he goes to Basel World or not, but we will see. Didn't Bitcoin plummet a few years ago? Like the Yankee Duel says. Bitcoin, historically, you can look at the charts. It goes up, it goes down. It goes up, it goes down. I'll, I'll actually pull up a chart here um, so we can take a look at it, hopefully. Hopefully we can take a look at it. If I can get signed in here. Um, and I can show you the history of it. <clears throat> oh, shoot. i got to put my two-step verification in. Oh, come on. It's uh, these damn hackers. They, they create all this, all this stuff. All these hassles for us. You know, all this like tooth factor, all this crap because of the damn hackers. I think they should shoot them. If they took the hackers out and just shot them in the head, then all of a sudden, you know, people would stop hacking and ca stop causing all these problems for people. Right? Right. Okay, let me see if we can find Bitcoin here. All time. Okay, here we go. Here be the graph. All right. So, let's see here. We're going to go through the timeline. Here, way back here, and right about in here, in February of 2013, I guess, it was 30 bucks. That was when I started buying. And then it went up to 900. You can see there it went up to $1,000. And I think this was the Mount Goss crash. Uh, then it crashed down. Okay, and it went down to $400. Then this was when we had like a long, like sideways. It went down as low as 200, 200 and something. 
this was a long bear market, right? Where it, where it went down and then it just kind of went along. And then we had another halving in 2016 and it went up to the halving. You can see there it went up to around 400 and something. Then it went up some more. Then it, then it was up to 681. And then I bought some more when it was like around 1,200. I talked about it again on my channel when it was around 1,200. Where is it? Where's 1,200? Right, right around in here I bought some because I thought it was getting ready for a run. And that's when my dad interviewed the Bitcoin Meister. And we got a video on the channel of him interviewing him. And then it went along, and then it started the big run. And the end of 2017, that's when it did this big run here. And it went up to, it peaked at around 20,000. We're not really seeing the number here, but it was around, it was around 20,000 was the peak. And I sold some at around 15,000. Uh, you know, when it was around 15,000. Um, and then it peaked. And then we've had this long down through all of 2018. Went up and down, up and down. Then it, then it kind of plateaued down around the low 3,000s. And then it... Um, I can't really show you the low 3,000s. But it went down to like 3,100. And that's when I told some people on the channel that I was buying, I bought a couple more Bitcoin, was down around 3,100. Um, and then now it's just kind of like going sideways and been staying around 38, 37, 3,800 for a long time, for, you know, months. Um, so I think we're going to get another pullback. I think it's going to come down again, uh, maybe even as low as, as a thousand or twelve hundred bucks. If it does, that's when I'm going to buy more. I'm going to jump in and buy a bunch more if it gets that low. If it doesn't get that low, then I'm probably going to wait it out and just see what happens. Uh, but historically, when it does the next run up, it will run up higher than the previous run. That's what it does every time. Every time there's a new bull market, it always sets new higher highs which means it'll go higher than 20,000 a coin. It'll probably go up to like 50,000 a coin or whatever. Next time it has a big run up and then it'll pull back again. And then next time it pulls back, it might pull back to 10,000. You know, t typically when it pulls back, it doesn't pull back as much as it did the previous time. So it runs up high and then it pulls back and then it goes up again. That's what it's done historically for 10 years. So but again, past performance doesn't mean that's what it's going to continue to do. It could go to zero. I don't think so, because there's a lot of people starting to put money into it. So I doubt it's going to go to zero. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Uh, Craig, what's the backstory of why it's called Little Treasury and not Big Treasury? Uh, good question. I don't know why he named it that. Maybe because it's not a big place? The difference between Craig and someone who goes broke on a bad investment is he doesn't dump more than he can afford to lose into Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I invested a relatively small amount uh, back in the day. Um, and right now, like I said, I, I sold enough previously that I'm playing with the house's money right now. I'm... You know, I could lose all of my Bitcoin and it wouldn't matter. I mean, as far as my investment goes, I mean, I'm I'm already in, <laughs> I've already taken my money out <laughs> uh, when I sold back in, in uh, you know, in, in the fall of uh, 2017. And that was a long term capital gain. So I only had to pay 15 percent on the gains. So that worked out OK. Um so yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm going to hold the rest of my Bitcoin. I'm not selling any more. Period. I'm going to hold it. And somebody told me. Somebody said the other. Well, what good does it do you if you hold it? You know. Uh, you know. What, what good is that? Why do you hold any investment? I hold it because I think it's going to continue to go up. I think long term it's going to be a good thing to hold. And so I'm going to 
I'll sell other things before I'll sell my Bitcoin. I'm getting a better return on it historically than anything any of my other investments. So I'm going to hold it. Um, you know, and, and later you can you can loan it out. You can do things with it without having to sell it. There's already a, a an operation right now that lets you. I don't know that I trust them, so I'm not going to let them hold my Bitcoin. But there's already an operation that you can put your Bitcoin in their wallet and have them take custody of your Bitcoin, hold it, and they'll pay you interest. I think they pay like 7% interest or something on the Bitcoin. So there's already an operation that does that. And that's the sort of thing that some of these companies are going to bring in on top of Bitcoin, where they're going to start offering services where they'll, they'll hold your Bitcoin for you, just like a bank would hold your money, and they'll pay you interest or whatever. Um, so that's going to be happening. So there'll be ways to make money with your Bitcoin without having to sell it. Um, I love your channel and your Grand Seikos and Rolex Day Date. Okay, well, there you go. Craig, did Dudley lose his, his Day Date in the scuffle? No, I think he still has the Day Date. I think they just kicked him out of the, out of the group. Uh, let's see. You, you probably saw the, 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 the thread in there. Some of these people are real pieces of work. I mean, <laughs> I hate to tell you guys, but some of the people in the watch community are real pieces of work. Um, you know, a lot, number of them have, have attacked me. Um, so it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> I can't believe how many people really want a crash to happen it's not going to be fun folks I doubt the first thing you'll be thinking about is is buying a Rolex watch when you mean when you say crash what do you mean you mean crash as in the whole economy goes south or just the watch market goes south or both yeah if the whole economy goes south it's it can be painful it can be a painful thing to ride ride out Plus, the dollar value will die, and you won't be able to buy anything. It'll be like the old days. You'll need to trade with people to get something. Yeah, I don't think it's going to get that dire. I don't think things are going to. What determines its price? Vegas acts. you got to know. Even hold, no, no one to fold them, no one to walk away. Absolutely, and I'm not going to walk away. I'm staying in the game. What determines its price? Okay, Bitcoin. Like any commodity or any item, like a watch or whatever, the price is determined by who's willing to pay what for it. And there are what's called exchanges all over the world where people buy and sell Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. The other cryptocurrencies, I believe, are scams. I, I wouldn't buy any of them, even though some people have made money on some of them. Uh, I would stick with Bitcoin myself because I think it's the one that has the best chance of surviving and actually being a real thing. I don't think, I think the others, most of them are wish, wishful thinking. Um, so anyway, it's traded on exchanges. That's what determines the value. And the unique thing about Bitcoin, and I've got a link in the description of this channel. Go to my craigship.com slash downloads page. I got a whole section on Bitcoin in there. I got stuff in there about money and all kinds of things in there. It's kind of cool stuff there. I'm going to take a look. But anyway, the, um, the cool thing about Bitcoin is the total amount of Bitcoin that will be created over time by the system, by the network, is 21 million Bitcoin. It's capped at that. That's baked into the software. So it's a limited supply item, okay? The other thing about Bitcoin is if somebody loses access to their Bitcoin, which happened in the early days more often than it's happening now, but it e it's even happening now where people forget their login credentials or they, they lose their private key, they lose access to their Bitcoin one way or another. If they can't access it, nobody else can either. It can't be recycled. It can't be reissued to somebody else. It's just on the blockchain, and it's not going to move. 
In other words, it's not going to be spent. It's not going to be sold. It's not going to be moved from one person to another because the person that had access to it now no longer has access. And so that those Bitcoin are not going to be in circulation. 15 million Bitcoin in circulation when all is said and done. That's a very limited supply item. To give you an idea of how limited that supply is, there are 36 million millionaires in the world. In this whole world, there are 36 million millionaires. Okay, so that means millionaires, there aren't enough Bitcoin for them to have one half of a Bitcoin. Each millionaire, there aren't enough to go around. If you take the total supply that will be available. There are also 20 cities in this world that have populations higher than 15 million people that each person in that city, that one city, like you take Tokyo, for example, each person in that city will not be able to own one Bitcoin. There aren't enough Bitcoin to go around is what I'm trying to show you here. It's a very limited supply item. So as it continues to become a worldwide system of exchanging value, of storing value, as it becomes more and more commonplace for people to use it as a store of value, like the people in Venezuela are doing right now, it will become more and more valuable because of that limited supply. And the system is extremely robust. It's never been hacked. It, it's extremely reliable. So it has a 10-year track record of doing what it needs to do to, that, that demonstrates that it is a reliable store of value, that you can hold your Bitcoin and hold your private key and do it properly, and you know your Bitcoin are safe. That's a pretty powerful thing, and that's a pretty powerful mechanism that's been put in place by some of the smartest people in the world that are programmers on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, you've got to know, okay, we already read that. If the market crashes, Dudley will swap his day date for a gallon of milk. <laughs> yes, the whole market is what I'm talking about because you said... Also, 80% of the people in the USA have no money at all. Then they will get desperate. Um, it could be a very long time before the house of cards starts crumbling. They can, the Fed can prop up the economy for a long time with quantitative easing, just printing more money. Uh, remember... Uh, People must remember that the U.S. is the aircraft carrier of the world's economy. Over 25% of the world GDP is the U.S. Currently, our economy is the envy of the world, and socialism didn't get us there. You got that right. <laughs> you got that right. So, so I'm going to just slowly but surely... Uh, probably keep accumulating some Bitcoin on the dips. I mean, I feel comfortable that I have a pretty good chunk of Bitcoin now that I'm probably okay if I don't buy any more, but I'm probably just going to slowly but surely increase my, my stash, if you will, just in case everything hits the fan. I think Bitcoin will be a very uh, a good store of value and a, 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 a safe harbor when the storms hit, I think it will be a good place to have some of your value uh, stashed if, if all does break loose. Let's see. Um, Bitcoin being a limited supply item may not be positive. I actually see it as a negative, Yankee Doodle says. Not those of us that own it don't. <laughs> the negative, the U.S. dollar, where they can just print more anytime they want, that's why the U.S. dollar has lost so much of its purchasing power over time, is because they can just print more. It's lost more than 90% of its purchasing power in the last 100 years. I mean, Bitcoin's going to go the other direction. It will become more and more valuable. And so, yeah, I would much rather hold uh, Bitcoin uh, than the U.S. dollar. But you do what you want. <clears throat> you do what you want. Um, 
most of these Democrats who are starting to run for president in 2020 are socialist nutcases. <laughs> the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of spending other people's money. <laughs> Good point. Good point. The problem is both parties are very corrupt. Uh, there's, there's a lot of corruption, and it's the big money in the system that is, is corrupting it. And whether you have socialism with its crony capitalism, where, you know, you've got the people at the top that are deciding who to give the contracts to, and they, they make sure their buddies get all the deals and all that, you know, that's your typical socialism. Or you have capitalism like we have now, where the system has become corrupted by the big corporations kind of controlling the, the congressmen, the senators, and all that, you know, with money, donations, all that. And so it, it's, you get that, that corruption. But our system is not nearly as corrupt as a lot of the systems around the world. I mean, it's not a perfect system by any means, but it's probably the best of all the rest that are out there, right? But there is still a fair amount of corruption uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, corporations controlling the elected officials. Uh, let's see. Um, the country eventually goes broke with socialism. Look at Russia, Germany, Argentina, people. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. This has been a fun broadcast. We did discuss a little bit the, the watches, the, the uh, daily wear watches. And I'm going to continue to... Um, I'm going to continue to study this. I'm not going to, I've decided I'm not going to make a move until the fall as far as if I'm going to get another watch, if I'm going to sell the Grand Seiko Spring Drive Stunner. I've already said if I do sell that, I'm only going to sell it to a subscriber. Uh, and if I do sell that, then I'm going to be forced into a situation where I'm going to have to make a decision and buy what my, my next watch, if I do sell that, my next watch is going to be a watch that can be used all around, that can be used for dress or sport. It's going to be a versatile watch that, that, that I think I can force into both use cases. And it might be a date 840. Um, what's to say they won't issue more Bitcoin as supply diminishes? Well, that's a good question. Um, it is all built into the algorithm in the system, you would need a consensus of a majority of the, it's complicated, but a majority of the miners and or the, those that are running nodes, I mean, there, there has to be a certain a majority to do what's called a hard, I think it would have to be a hard fork. Um, and so they would have to change the, the structure, which is very difficult to do. And that's one of, the, one of the, the powerful things about Bitcoin is it is so hard to change any critical aspect of it. Um, I mean, that's what makes it good is that, that robustness of the, the system and where people can't just monkey around with it, right? One guy, there's not one guy in charge. He can't just go in and change it, right? It has to be a consensus of a whole bunch of people that have to agree to do that and it's very hard to get them to agree right uh, so that's why bitcoin has actually been uh naysayers have actually thought that that's a negative thing that bitcoin won't change with the times right w won't modernize and won't do this hey, hey we want to try this this is a good idea let's try this and 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 the Bitcoin folks are like, no, sorry, we're not going to try that. You try that with your coin, with your altcoin, right? You do those, that experimentation over there. We're not going to mess around with it over here. They, they like to keep Bitcoin robust and solid and running. And, and so it's, it's extreme. It's not impossible that they do a hard fork and that they change that and say, okay, we're going to do 40 million coins. It's, it's not impossible but it would be highly unlikely and very difficult to do. Um, one of the main reasons why it would be very difficult to do is a lot of the people that would be making the decision to do it are people that are holding Bitcoin. 
And the last thing they want to do is dilute the value of their Bitcoin. I mean, I would never vote for it. I would never vote for more circulation. The Bitcoin Meister would never vote for more. Trace Mayer would never vote for more. None of the Bitcoiners that have been around a long time would ever vote for I expanding the supply. So, and the miners wouldn't vote for it because they're holding, most of them are holding Bitcoin. And that's how they get their reward is by mining Bitcoin. And the value of the Bitcoin is, is very critical to, to them continuing to mine. So, and then once it's all mined out, they're going to make their money on transaction fees. So the miners are still going to be making money on transaction fees. And the only way they're going to make money on transaction fees is if the system is robust and people are using it for transactions and so on. And if you start diluting the value of the Bitcoin and all that, people are going to be like, well, I don't want to use this. This, this is just like fiat currency. This is just like the U.S. dollar. What's the difference here, right? So the... You know, the short answer is I think it's very difficult for that to happen. Um, and, and I don't think it's going to happen. And most experts don't think it's going to happen. So, yeah, I don't think we have to worry about um, them increasing the supply. And remember, it's divisible down to, is it eight or ten digits? I keep getting that confused. But, you know, you can buy point oh 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 one Bitcoin, right? You don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. So don't worry about the fact that it, if it goes to a million dollars of Bitcoin, you'll still be able to buy one penny's worth. That's how divisible it is. So point oh 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 you know one. It, it'll basically be one penny's worth, assuming one Bitcoin is worth a million dollars, right? You can. It's still divisible down that far. So you don't have to worry. That's called one satoshi. Is the the smallest unit of Bitcoin is called one satoshi. So you don't have to worry about it being not divisible down to enough pieces. It's basically, you can cut it into, you know, many, 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 many pieces, one Bitcoin. So it's not really an issue. Um, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think you will ha be happy unless you have a GS for accuracy. I hear you about the accuracy. I, I'm really spoiled with that. Another fabulous show. As a 60-plus-year-old professional, your advice is always spot on. Learn from the old guys. You will make less mistakes in life. I hear you. Yeah, I love learning from the older folks. Cheers, lads. Nice to be around like-minded individuals. Great comments. Uh, let's see here. If Facebook only had enough space for 21 million subscribers... It wouldn't be the company that it is. Well, you see, you don't understand, Yankee. You're always going to be able to buy Bitcoin. It'll just be, it'll just be a question of how much you're going to have to pay for it. So, and, and you might not be able to buy a whole Bitcoin. You might not have enough money to buy it, right? If a whole Bitcoin's a million dollars, for example, and you've only got $1,000, then obviously you're not going to buy a whole Bitcoin. But you can still buy $1,000 worth. So it's not like you're going to be left out. I mean, you're, you're still going to be able to buy Bitcoin. But nobody's going to force you to buy it, right? You would only buy it if you wanted it for some reason. That's the beauty of Bitcoin. That's the thing I really like about Bitcoin is it's totally voluntary. It's worldwide. It, it has no government involved in it. It's not regulated by any government. It's not controlled by any government. It's not controlled by any bank. It's not controlled by any one entity, period. It's totally decentralized and all over the world, and it's totally voluntary. And I think that's the way money should be. I think money should be totally voluntary. And I think it should be stable. I think it should be consistent. I think it should work by certain rules. And, and Bitcoin is governed by mathematics. I mean, you can't get any more exact than that. It's governed by math mathematics. Uh, and it's powered by electricity. And it does what it does, day in and day out. And nobody can hack it. Nobody can influence it. Um, now, an exchange can get hacked. If you've got somebody holding your Bitcoin for you, like Mount Goss got hacked big time, if you've got some third party holding your Bitcoin and they control the private keys, that's really not your Bitcoin. It's really theirs. They're the ones that have the private keys. Whoever has the private keys has control of the Bitcoin. 
So if you give up your private keys and you got somebody else holding your Bitcoin and then they get hacked, somebody finds out your private keys because they didn't keep them secure enough. They had them written down somewhere and some guy grabbed the piece of paper, right? Whatever. I mean, your Bitcoin can be gone. But that's not Bitcoin being hacked. That's the, the exchange not taking proper precautions uh, security-wise, just like a bank getting robbed, right? It doesn't mean that the dollar bill got robbed. The, the bank got robbed of the dollar bill. The dollar bill is still what it is. It still does what it does. The Bitcoin still does what it does. So, um, so no, the fact that there's 21 million, uh, there's, there's already more than 21 million people that own Bitcoin. There's a lot of people that own a fraction of a Bitcoin. I mean, Sarah only owns a, a couple hundred dollars worth, right? That's a small fraction of a Bitcoin. So there's a lot of people that own a, a small fraction of a Bitcoin, and there always will be. There will always be people that only have, you know, 20 or $30 worth of Bitcoin. That's fine. We, we don't, you can own as much as you want. Uh, what if the federal government changes regulations? They, they can't regulate it. It's not in their purview. It's not in their jurisdiction. It's worldwide. Um, the only thing the federal government, if you're talking about the, the United States government, could do is they could pass laws. They could say, just like with prohibition, where they passed a law and said you can't drink, they could pass a law and say you can't have a Bitcoin wallet on your phone. Uh, it's going to be very hard for them to enforce that, just like it was very hard for them to enforce prohibition. And it would also be shooting themselves in the foot because a lot of commerce and a lot of, of business is going to be built around Bitcoin. And right now out west, I think it's Montana or somewhere. Was it Montana or Wyoming? Maybe it was Wyoming. One of them just passed laws making it very friendly for, for cryptocurrency companies, including people working on Bitcoin, to come and locate there. And it's a tax-free zone. They don't tax it. Like, they, they make income from it and all that. They don't tax it and all that. So they're, they're, they're welcoming them with open arms, right? And there are countries that are doing the same thing, that are welcoming cryptocurrency with open arms. So it's going to be a competitive thing where there are going to be environments that want it and want you to go there and invest and so forth. And if the United States says you can't do it here, that's going to be shooting themselves in the foot because people will go do it somewhere else. And so they'll be missing out. So, like I say, it's going to be very difficult for any entity to attack Bitcoin and to try to shut Bitcoin down because the cat's out of the bag. It's all over the world now. And people all over the world are using it. And it's going to be very, very difficult to come up with a legitimate argument to try to shut it down. Um, it's going to be fun to see, though. It's going to be fun to see as these folks squirm and, and you know, like the J.P. Morgans of this world, the banks, the, the, the central banks and all. It's going to be interesting to see as Bitcoin really takes off. It's going to be interesting to see. They will try to fight it at some point. They'll try to do things. But it's going to be... Um, very difficult, <laughs> like trying to stop the internet, you know, put up these firewalls and they try to do this and then people use VPNs. I mean, you know, it's just so, it's, it's, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be fun to watch though. Very fun to watch. I may buy a few pur purely for spec speculation. I'd rather buy gold. Hey, do what you want, you know, absolutely do what you want. I wouldn't want to have no Bitcoin though. Now, I would not recommend anybody invest in anything if they have any debt whatsoever. I would say pay off all your debts first. That's including the house. Pay off all your debts first and then invest with, with money. That's how I would always recommend people do. Um, so, it didn't work when the U.S. confiscated gold. <clears throat> And the thing about gold is it, it's a little bit easier for them to take actions against gold because, you know, gold is a physical thing that you got to ship around and all that. And like, like they can easily, well, not easily, but they can intercept it at ports of entry. And there's, there's ways that they can try to get their hands literally on the gold and confiscate it, right? Bitcoin, you can literally have your private keys to your Bitcoin in your head. You can memorize the phrase, right? And you can have it in your head. 
and you can cross borders. You can go right from one country to another, and they'd have no way of knowing that you even have any Bitcoin. You know, so, and I'm in a publicly state right now. I don't have any Bitcoin. I used to have some, you know, years ago, but I, I don't have any anymore. Uh, so there's how, that's how that works. Um, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know anything about any Bitcoin. So there's that. Um, can we find out how much money is currently invested in Bitcoin? Yeah, on, on uh, CoinMarketCap. I'll pull it up. Um, where's CoinMarketCap? Uh, let me pull it up. They'll tell you. It's like less money than than Bill Gates is worth. It's like 60 some odd billion dollars. Um, so it's still a very small amount of money. Um, Bitcoin dominance right now is 51.3%. So of all the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin is 51.3 of the value. So here's the market caps. Bitcoin is 68 billion right now. And it's at 39.16 on, on coin market cap. It varies from exchange to exchange. It was, was 3,800 and something on Coinbase, right? Um, so that's another interesting thing to look at is how small that market cap is. I mean, there's literally trillions of dollars in gold and, and there's tr you know hundreds of trillions of dollars in, in real estate and all these other things right, that people are using as stores of value, right? There's literally many, many trillions of dollars. So if even a small fraction of that money starts getting routed into Bitcoin, if people just say, I'm going to put 1% of my money in Bitcoin or a half a percent, like, the, like Fidelity just set up a custody thing where they're, they're offering Bitcoin to some of their bigger customers. And if Fidelity goes to their bigger customers and says, hey, just put a half a percent in here as a hedge, just, just in case. I mean, that's going to add up fast to a lot of freaking money. And so you can see that's why it went up to like 20 grand at the end of 2017, because there was a bunch of money jumping in because they thought that some ETFs were going to be approved. And a bunch of people where there was FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. A bunch of people were jumping in. And then none of that was really going to happen, at least not that soon. And so a bunch of people panicked. And, of course, they started selling. And you know how bubbles work, right? Up and then down. Um, but it just shows you that run-up just shows you that it doesn't take much. It, it doesn't take much of, a, of a, uh, money coming in to move that price, Okay. It can, it can move pretty quickly because you got, as an analogy I saw, it was like this guy had a five-gallon bucket of water, right? A big five-gallon bucket. And he had like a little test tube, right? A little, little test tube, right? And he was like, if you took the money that people have invested in other forms of store of value and you wanted to put it in Bitcoin, it would be like taking this bucket and pouring it into that test tube, Right? there's not enough space, right? I mean, it's just going to, the value is just going to explode, right? Because again, it's such a limited supply item. There's so few of them available that if all of these people all of a sudden just start, you know, a very small percentage of people right now hold Bitcoin. It's probably like a tenth of 1% or something. It's a very small percentage of people that own any Bitcoin at all. Right. So if, if all of a sudden more people start buying Bitcoin, it, the price can do nothing but go up. I mean, that's just that's just the supply and demand. Um, you have inspired my interest in Bitcoin. I am banking on it for my future in five to ten years, Dean says. Oh, do you own Bitcoin now? Thank you, dude. My only investments now are income producing rental properties. I should diversify, though. I hear you. Yeah, I, I love real estate. I have real estate. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm diversified, definitely. Um, I wouldn't want to have everything in real estate. I'm probably, 
sixty percent in real estate at least, maybe sixty five percent, which is still heavy. But I like real estate. I mean, I'm, I just like it. Uh, so that's the name of that tune. Um, all right. Oh, broadcast interrupted. Uh oh. Um. All right, I don't know what happened. It said that the broadcast was interrupted. Was it actually interrupted? No, you're on. I don't know why my unit gives me that warning sometimes. Um, so it wasn't, it was never interrupted. There wasn't a glitch in the, um, my only investments now are in, okay, no, you're on, Craig, are WAGs. And, and WAGs and I are probably going to have a show where we talk about investing and finance and things like that um, at some point. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, Wags, I don't think you have any Bitcoin, right? Um, I don't think he has any Bitcoin. But anyway, I think we're going to have a show where we're going to talk more broadly about investing and finance and all that stuff at some point. So I think we're going to do that. Um, you're right, Craig. For example, I have my Bitcoin wallet tattooed to my foreskin, Dan T. Too much information. Yeah. Um, no, unfortunately, our wags. Yeah, he might be the only millionaire that won't have one Bitcoin. Well, actually, there's going to be a lot of millionaires that won't have one Bitcoin. We went through that. There's not enough around for every bit millionaire to have one Bitcoin. But um, uh, if our wags buys a Bitcoin, then he'll be one of those millionaires that does have a Bitcoin. He'll be in the elite. Uh, that's, a, that's what's kind of cool is if you have one Bitcoin, just one, you're going to be considered elite. Yeah, assuming Bitcoin does what it potentially can do, becomes a worldwide reserve currency, a store value, and so on. Just having one Bitcoin will put you in the elite. Uh, so there's that. All right, folks, I'm going to wrap it up. That's been a good show. Been a really good show. We solved a lot of the world's problems. Hey, subscribe and hit the bell. Hit the bell. That's what I say. Hit the bell.